Okay. So uh, welcome at the hub of uh, presentation of the Netherlands. Uh, I am from the VU University of Amsterdam. Uh, we are the hub coordinators and uh, part of the uh, Arbeit Tools Consortium. But we are very happy that uh, we brought our hub friends here. Over there you see uh, occupying a very central position at this table, Laurens Hessels from the Rathenau Institute, which is one of the remaining technology assessment institutes in Europe. And uh, you will uh, later see Wouter Boon, who is uh, working at the Utrecht University, uh, also on the dynamics of innovation. So in uh, the Netherlands, we have uh, been witnessing a, a flourishing practice of uh, science society interactions in different uh, forms and purposes. So uh, public engagement, stakeholder dialogues, uh, technology assessment, be it in more critical or interactive ways, uh, but also uh, co-production of knowledge and open innovation. Uh, here you see a, a program for responsible innovation, the left uh, picture, uh, initiated by the Dutch Research Council. The middle picture is a broad societal dialogue about nanotechnology, which uh, was intended to be really democratic, uh, democratic and also have policy impacts at the same time. The, um, First uh, best practice example that I want to show you is an example of uh, our own institute, the Athena Institute. Um, it's a cooperation with the Burns Foundation, uh, which is a foundation, uh, the name says it, uh, for people with Burns. Um, uh, they, wanted, uh, they asked us uh, to come up with a dialogue model for agenda setting. They wanted to distribute their funding uh, resources uh, according to the needs of patients, the needs and concerns uh, of patients. So uh, we organized this uh, stepwise multi-stakeholder uh, dialogue and uh, one of the most surprising results was that itching is a primary concern. And if you think about burns, you might say, hey, that's logical. Uh, I can imagine that itching is a big problem. But it was not researched as, at all. No researchers in the Netherlands asked this question. They were all more interested in fundamental mechanisms of how burns uh, 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 are created or uh, how you can treat them, uh, skin transplantation, etc. Uh, and uh, during the dialogue sessions, all the different stakeholders agreed that re uh, research into itching was an important thing to do. And uh, here you see also the stubbornness of a research system. It took years before the research and innovation system finally managed, even though everybody wanted it, to put itching on the agenda. But I think five or six years later, this, uh, this uh, finally happened. So uh, this is a practice, I think, that shows a lot of the different dimensions of research and responsible research and innovation. So inclusive deliberation, but also adaptive change in the end. And now I will uh, hand over the stick to Wouter. Thank you, thank you, Frank. Uh, the second uh, uh, example we wanted to show you is the example of a very large-scale research program in the Netherlands, uh, which is called uh, Knowledge for Climate. It's a knowledge uh, program about uh, climate resilience or climate adaptation or how to adapt to, to climate change. And this program uh, is, is, uh, it was very big. It was uh, 50 million euros big, so 5 -0, uh, 5, 50 million uh, euros big. And one of the key terms in this program was the term knowledge co-creation or knowledge co-production in the sense that in, on, on every level of the program you see a collaboration between uh, scientists, uh, people from academia but also people from research institutes really uh, co-investigating with uh, for example uh, knowledge users so uh, people working at municipalities, people working at ministries, people working at uh, consultancy firms but also uh, people uh, just, uh, just people from the, the general public. And uh, you see this on every level. So you see this on the program level in terms of agenda setting, which programs, which, which projects need to be financed. You see it on the project level, but you also see it on the level in between because every, uh, the, the whole program was organized via or through uh, different hotspots. So the Netherlands 
uh, was uh, yeah, subdivided in hotspots which uh, needed to uh, study a particular aspect of uh, climate adaptation. And these hotspots were obviously hotspots where, which are in, in danger of, of getting, uh, getting hurt by climate change. So for example the uh, Rotterdam port, the port of Rotterdam or the Schiphol uh, airport or uh, the areas close to, close to the sea. Um, but there were two challenges. We studied these projects and these hotspots. There were two challenges very prominent in this, in this program. First of all, it was very difficult to have uh, both including every uh, different disciplines, not only scientific disciplines, but also disciplines from, from, from societal disciplines, so to say, and at the same time come up with a very concrete project at the end. So you have a, a, a divergence and convergence of, of, of the content of these projects, which was very difficult to manage. And we found that it was very important to organize this uh, beforehand, so at the start of the project. That was the first finding, actually, of our studies. So project management during the project is very uh, important but what is more important is to uh, really organize it at the first instances of this project. The second challenge is also something which the German case uh, uh, alluded to, is that it's very difficult for the people inside this project, so inside this protective space, so to say, to also align with the incentives they have in their respective home organizations. So we have academic researchers needed to do the project, but also need to have their academic publications for their universities to show to their university bosses. And the same goes for the knowledge users. So people from municipalities wanted to really uh, produce knowledge in these projects, but in the end their incentives lie with the, with the municipalities. So with the eldermen they needed to satisfy, so to say. So this uh, protective space is in the one hand protecting people inside, uh, the inside these projects to, to do their work and to do their uh, co knowledge co-production work. At the same time, it's difficult for them to also um, yeah, deal with, with uh, the things they are dealing in their home organizations. But most of the projects showed that, it's, that, that it really worked out, so that uh, people were very much uh, yeah, working towards aligning these, uh, these incentive systems and that, it's, that they succeeded in, in, in that. So that would be our second example. Our third example, we'll go to, over to you, Lauwens. Yep. I'm uh, Lauwens Hessels, uh, working with the Rathenau Institute at, uh, as a researcher in uh, science policy studies. And uh, Frank already indicated that uh, my institute has a history of over 25 years in technology assessment. So I could... Um, uh, use many examples maybe from my own uh, institute to uh, discuss today, but I chose a different one. I chose to um, uh, talk about uh, laboratory engagement studies, which I um, personally like a lot as, a, as an example uh, of responsible research and innovation. Um, you see on this, uh, on this picture uh, our Dutch uh, colleague uh, Dan Schuurbiers, who uh, was intensively involved in this uh, type of work using the method of uh, midstream modulation, indicating that uh, you interact uh, with, uh, a, as a philosopher or ethicist, not uh, before and not after the research, but actually during the primary process on the lab. Um, and in this, uh, with this method, um, he worked uh, roughly 12 weeks in different, uh, uh, on, on a laboratory with different researchers um, and, and really on the spot discussing with them step by step uh, what they were doing. And what is so promising ab about this uh, method is that I think the, the, all the, the practical steps and the, the uh, minor uh, choices that researchers make on a lab um, have potential very uh, broad implications. Uh, primary, uh, of course, for the project itself, but maybe also for the uh, consequences of the research in, in uh, society at large. So if you choose a particular model organism as a, a biotechnologist, um, or, or you uh, look at a, at a measurement and you say either this is valid or I reject it, this can have, have strong implications. Um, 
Thank you. Um, and and a, a very important instrument for this work is the decision protocol, which uh, you see on, on the right of the slide, which uh, shows how you can discuss with the researcher the opportunities uh, and alternatives at a particular moment and help him or her think about the uh, considerations and the outcomes uh, in later stages. So, um, and, and what, what is the result of this type of work is that you can make uh, uh, researchers on the lab uh, more reflexive. So to, to close, um, what, what, what is uh, very promising about this type of work, I think, is the intensity of the interaction and the fact that you work during the primary uh, process and look at actual decisions that uh, researchers make uh, on the laboratory. Thank you. Thank you.